One, this is Andrea Patton with the Disabilities Commission, and we will get started. I'm going to read the open meeting law statement. The open meeting law requires that I notify the public that this meeting is recorded. Therefore, please be aware that an audio and visual recording of this meeting is being made by Boston City TV, a part of the City of Boston Cable Office of Cable Communications, and is being broadcast on Xfinity Channel 24, RCN Channel 13, and Fios Channel 962. With that, I hand it over to our chair, Olivia Richard, to begin the meeting. Happy New Year. This is Olivia Richard, and I call the January meeting of the Disability Commission Advisory Board to order. So let's start with introductions. I am Olivia, and I am from Brighton. Um, Alice, you want to start us off? Sorry about that. Uh, I'm Alice Fisher, and uh, I live here in the South End. And shall I turn it over to um, Andrea Patton? Let's, next person will be Elizabeth ah. Dean Flower. Hi everyone, happy 2022. I'm Elizabeth Dean Flower, I'm the Vice Chair of the board and I live in Back Bay. Awesome, Carl. My name is Carl Richardson. I am I am a deafblind individual and I live in Brighton Center. Uh, George or Paul? Sorry, Paul. Paul, are you there? Okay, we'll move on to Juan Carlos. Hello, everyone. This is Juan Ramirez, a commission member, and I live in Boston, South End. Okay, and Wes, Wesley. Hello, everybody. I'm Wesley Ireland. I'm using American Sign Language, and I'm an advisory board member, and I live in. Excellent. OK, let's move on to approval of minutes. Um, do I hear a motion to accept uh, the minutes for December? I may, I make a, this is Carl Richardson, I make a motion to approve the minutes. Is there a second? This is Juan Ramirez, I second that motion. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, Any opposed? Okay, the motion passes. The minutes are approved. Let's uh, continue to a presentation from the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Advancement. Take it away. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Luigi Lalane, and I serve as Community Engagement Coordinator for the Boston Mayor's Office for Immigrant Advancement. As you can tell, that was a mouthful. We're going to call the department Moya for now. <laughs> so uh, let's see if I can share my screen. So Perfect. Luigi, sorry, this yeah. oh, you are able? OK, great, sorry. Yes, thank you so much. No worries. Uh, let me just bring this back here. Right. 
So hopefully everyone is able to see my screen. Is that is that good? I want to make sure. This is Andrew. Right, yeah, we so can I'm see it. So I'm gonna start. Thank you so much for having me today. Again, my name is Luigi, and just an overview of this presentation. I'll talk a little bit about um, Boston's uh, immigrant communities and how that gave way to the birth of our office. And I'll go a little bit into our strategic plan and um, the initiatives that we have under each one of them that helps us accomplish our mission. So, and we'll wrap up with contact information and any questions that you may have. So, to begin, uh, an overview of Boston's um, immigrant home populations. It has been estimated that one in four Bostonians is an immigrant. Um, and what that means is since the 1970s, we've seen an increase of various immigrant groups in Boston, totaling to about 27.9% today. And these are only of the, this is a number representing only foreign born individuals. So the number of immigrants in Boston is actually much bigger because those folks actually have kids, they have family members that they bring along. So Boston's population, immigrant community is actually pretty big. And those immigrants do come from various um, co countries, um, from the Americas, Asia, Europe, and Africa, representing almost, all, actually over 100 countries um, around the world. And one thing that I like to do with anyone that I'm presenting to is give a little pop quiz question. I promise this is not a really hard question, just for me to assess um, in the group what your knowledge is of immigrant communities. So what do you think are the top three immigrant communities across the city of Boston? And feel free to just guess one or two. I'm happy to, to, to hear. And feel free to unmute yourself. Oh, group chat. All right, so someone says Cape Verdean is definitely one of them. Okay, so that's one, two more. Oh, wow. Vietnamese. Vietnamese, okay, one more, thank you. Russian, okay. So drum roll. And the next slide says, these are the top immigrant communities in Boston. We have a huge representation of Dominicans, Chinese, Haitians. If we go a little bit further down, we'll find Cape Verdeans, we'll find Brazilians. And there are Russians that are represented in Boston. They're just not as big but a huge community of them can be found in Brookline. So all of this to say that Boston is a melting pot, has many different cultures, many different languages that do come together to make it what it is. And across the different neighborhoods in Boston, this is how these immigrant communities are spread out from different groups to different community centers to any institution really that has those. And as a result, this gave birth to our office in 1998. We were known as the Mayor's Office of New Bostonian, but very recently rebranded to Moya. And so our goal continues to be to involve immigrants in Boston's civic, social, and cultural aspects of life. Not only do we work really hard to make sure that immigrants have the same access to services that all residents should enjoy, we also work very hard to highlight the great role that immigrants play in Boston's growth as a city. And the way that we go about doing our work is starting with equity, because given that we're under the equity cabinet, we understand that working together across all sectors to make resources available for everyone is important. And the way we go about making equitable access a thing is that we build partnerships with the community. So really having contacts not only in government and in different sectors, but also underground with different community members actually living the day to day um, life of an immigrant. And understanding their perspective gives way for innovation, right? So thinking creatively to find solutions to their challenges. And this brings about a sense of belonging, which allows people to get a sense of responsibility, advocating for themselves, advocating for others like them, which really brings us back to equity. So all of this being said, with our strategic plan, we, we resolve to have three different values to accomplish our work. Those are stability, integration and civic ownership. And with stability, we unite with immigrants to make sure that they feel safe. With integration, we wanna make sure that they're participating and in integrating in Boston, um, academically, culturally, uh, economically, you name it, we are here to do that. And we want folks to feel so stable and so integrated in Boston that they have opportunities to participate in government, right? So really, taking advantage of equitable access and really representing their communities. 
And so I'll just go a little bit um, into each of our values um, with some initiatives that we have for each of them to help you understand better how we do our work. So first, we are starting with stability. Again, helping folks feel, get a sense of stability in Boston, feeling safe. And one way that we do that is starting with the legal aspect of things. So we are currently and continuously working to counter a lot of the divisive national rhetoric and policies that came about, um, that have come about for years, but specifically under the Trump administration. And one way that we've resolved to do that is through the passing of the Trust Act. And this is an ordinance that defines the role of local police um, so that when they come across ICE agents, which usually um, deport people or put them in detention centers, um, it very much limits what information can be shared with them. And that, in turn, protects our immigrant um, residents, especially those that are undocumented. And we also participated in the creation of the Greater Boston Immigrant Defense Fund, which is a fund that came about through um, a lot of donations from, from great institutions and private organizations um, to, uh, to really provide funds to organizations that are doing work, um, that are providing Know Your Rights workshops. And these workshops tell people what their rights are um, if they come across ICE agents that could deport them and also provide the representation for people who are already in detention centers, really trying to get them back into American society and helping them integrate. So that's on the legal aspect of thing, but more on the macro level. Internally, we have our free immigration consultations. And these are held twice a month, where we connect any resident that calls us and we connect them with a volunteer lawyer that gives them advice on their immigration case. And because these lawyers are not actually employed by the city of Boston, they can only provide advice and not necessarily take on the cases. But what they end up doing is referring people to legal organizations that could take on the, those cases potentially at pro bono rates. And should people really need a private lawyer, then we can connect them as well. Hopefully, given that there's a payment plan that could help them meet the financial um, aspect um, to pay for their cases. And this is just an overview of general inquiries that we get for immigration consultations, I won't go a little bit too much into that, but you can see that family-based immigration is huge, employment base is huge, removal of defense is big, humanitarian is big. And so um, these um, are all different categories that the Greater Boston Immigrant Defense Fund has helped with in the past and continues to do. The last thing that I want to touch on on stability is related to COVID-19 pandemic. When the pandemic hit, um, what we did was we connected with a lot of our different community partners and got a good sense of what it was that our immigrant communities needed because they so often were not, and were always so overlooked or were on the back end of receiving resources. So we created a one pager of different city resources. For example, if somebody needed food access, right? We would connect, we would have the food access departments um, there and just very brief information about um, their meal sites and stuff. And we got that translated into 12, I'm sorry, 11 different languages. And this continues to be available on our website. And this provided a good sense, again, of stability for folks so that they know where to go to get the resources that they need. Moving on to integration, again, we rely a lot on partnerships with community partners. We collaborate with them to increase a sense of solidarity, which in itself helps folks participate in um, everyday, like day-to-day -day life. And the, a great segue from the previous slide is um, our Moya community webinars. And these webinars um, that we have, we have them with community partners. And this is a virtual continuation of the one pager that we created. We could not create a page that we needed to upload all the time, upgrade all the time, and get translated all the time. So we thought, why not create a virtual um, session, some info sessions? that we would have on a weekly basis or bi-weekly or, I'm sorry, bi-monthly or once a month to really address some of the major needs that we're seeing. So in a big example was in the beginning of the pandemic, people really needed access to food, right? And so we brought um, the Office of Food Access to come and talk about the different meal sites. But another problem was that people were afraid to go there because they thought maybe ICE agents were there to deport them. Or, and, and also there was a second problem that some of the food was not very ethnically coherent with what people were used to eat. So what we did was we brought someone else from Project Red um, to talk a little bit about um, 
how people could take advantage of the pandemic EBT and how they would not be penalized for it. And also we worked a lot with City Hall to um, get some funding for, to immigrant serving organizations so that they could partner with restaurants and do food deliveries that were, um, again, delivering food that were specific to these ethnic groups. So we found that to be super helpful. And also other collaborations that I'll mention um, are, are these um, four ones. Uh, let's see, we have 11 external partnerships um, that we dedicate funding to. Uh, we have a foreign trained professionals to help folks economically integrate in Boston. So this is a pilot fellowship program to support black foreign trained professionals from Africa and the Caribbean with experience in healthcare, but that are not necessarily able to get into healthcare. So this fellowship is really helping them build their network and find jobs. We also have the Dreamers Fellowship, which is a stipended leadership development and work preparedness initiative where Boston immigrant youth that are undocumented and unable to participate in the city's um, youth um, job programs um, are paired with local immigrants serving nonprofits to gain hands-on experience and acquire life skills on top of the stipend. Uh, another co-op that we have are, is one around green infrastructure where immigrants seeking to obtain national um, a, a certificate around green infrastructure landscape could participate in this co-op and, and really start building their wealth. And another last example that I'll give is a little bit more on the legal side. We have a TPS legal assistance where we're supporting Haitian entrants and a collaboration with a nonprofit that we've also provided some funding to, um, to, to help those who need to apply to TPS, for example. And we've also hired a legal access coordinator to support in this effort. And um, another thing that I'll share with our initiatives is that we have our immigrant information corners, and these are corners that anyone will find in all 20, across all 24 libraries and 12 YMCs in Boston with information about our office, and um, those corners would have information about the Disabilities Commission, just um, information available for immigrants um, as different aspects uh, of their lives are intersecting. The last piece that I want to cover now is civic ownership. So again, we want for folks to be so stabilized and so integrated in Boston that they're taking on these opportunities to build themselves and build their communities. So Citizenship Day is an initiative that we have in partnership with Project Citizenship. And we essentially help a lot of folks apply for citizenship in one day. But folks do have to qualify to apply for citizenship and uh, I believe in 2019, we were able to help almost 450. And during the pandemic, we led a virtual campaign, um, which also yielded about, uh, which also was able to help almost 150 people. Again, we partner with lawyers, different law students. We see if folks are able to receive a waiver so, so that they don't have to pay for their citizenship um, fees. And again, helping folks move forward so that they can have the same rights that other citizens will have, again, enabling them to um, advertise, advocate for their communities. The, so I have two more slides, um, this being one of them. We have Immigrants Lead Boston, which is a program for immigrants who wish to take a more civic ownership um, role in their community. So this, through this program, we, we teach about 18 to 20 different immigrants on how to navigate through City Hall, get resources, and bring these back to their communities. And they have some amazing civic, um, civic um, projects where they're participating in different groups. I believe we had, did have somebody from the Disabilities Commission come and talk to them, um, really to, to, to get an understanding about how City Hall works and really how to get those resources. And the last thing that I'll cover as far as programs go is our We Are Boston initiative. And through this fundraising um, event, we're able to hold an annual reception where we we can present we can not only share the great work that immigrants are doing immigrant nonprofits are doing but also share um the um funds that we've raised and we turn them into mini grants so that these could go to um immigrant serving organizations and and that in itself helps them uh, expand their um their capacity to continue to help immigrants and last but not least, if you want to reach out to us, you can always reach us at boston.gov forward slash immigrants. You can also sign up for our newsletter, um, which is also found, found, in the, found on that same page. And 
push comes to shove, you cannot reach us, please feel free to Im um, please feel free to email us at immigrantadvancement at boston.gov or call 617-635-2980. And if you've forgotten everything that I've told you today, at least you're connected to the Disabilities Commission and they're wonderful partners of uh, ours and so they could always refer you to us. And I timed myself, so time is up. Thank you so much, everyone. And I'm happy to take your questions if you have any. Questions? Yes. Let's see here. Um, Paul, you can go. Yes, I just wanted to introduce myself. I don't have a question, but you did a great job. Thank you for your presentation. Um, Paul Karen, advisory board member, West End Boston. Thank you. No problem. Thank you so much for introducing yourself. Great to meet you, George. I don't know if folks are typing questions. This is Andrea with the Disabilities Commission. Um, I just want to second what Luigi said. We were happy to partner with them uh, as the commission, uh, with, with the mayor's office, with Moya. Um, love partnering with them. So if there's ever any questions that you all have and you can't remember their phone number like you mentioned, we, we've got them all. Um, but we're looking forward to another great year of partnership. So I just want to add that in there. Likewise. Thank you so much. I actually have a question for you. Sure. Um, on that pie chart that you had up, what does humanitarian mean? So, is that like assisting folks with asylum cases and things like that, or? That is part of it. What a great question. That is part of it. So humanitarian cases, now I have to say that I am not super well versed in legal terminology, but humanitarian essentially helps people who have humanitarian needs. So people coming and seeking asylum, maybe escaping um, natural disasters or political instabilities and really uh, helping folks integrate in, in Boston. So not only is there a legal aspect to it, but there's also a social needs aspect to it. And so the cool thing with um, organizations that we've partnered with that are assisting um, residents with humanitarian cases is that we also connect them with other nonprofits to help them with housing, with food access, with all of the different aspects of life that somebody needs to integrate in Boston. And, and sometimes these cases get super specific because as one's immigration status changes, the needs are different. The resources to assist those needs may be different. So, so yes, so humanitarian kind of, yeah, <laughs> that's what it's all about. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Um, let's see. I don't see any other hands up and Olivia, this is Andrea. I see in the chat, uh, Juan Carlos has a question and then Wesley. Excellent. Okay. Juan Carlos, go ahead. Yes. Hi, Luigi. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was great. Um, just wanted to get some additional info from you. Perhaps I missed this part, but I know that you mentioned that some people have the ability or the opportunity to get immigration con consultations via volunteer lawyers or other kind of uh, advisors. Um, people who are seeking for these uh, options, are they able to uh, provide them with interpreters if they require different language or uh, some kind of accommodation? And if so, how long time ahead they have to um, tell them to make those accommodations uh, available? Thank you so much. Absolutely. What a great question. Thank you so much for asking it. So yes, um, people can participate in this. All they have to do is call our department and they will be signed up. Uh, uh, all of our lawyers, volunteer lawyers, uh, are given um, a number to call to get interpreters in any language that has been available. I, I'm not sure, I don't think there's ever been a lawyer that's called us and said, hey, that language is not available. So we have a wonderful language line. Um, big ups uh, to the Language and Communications Access Department, by the way, for helping the city make that available. And um, there also is uh, accommodation um, that is that is uh, available, right? So I, I, I typically we ask folks to get that ready two weeks in advance because we just want to ensure that if we if somebody's uh, asking for an ASL interpreter or if they need 
um, something visual, right? Because all of this is being done virtually over the phone. So if somebody needs a Zoom link, we just, we always ask that they do the request two weeks in advance so that we're able to provide that unless it's it's a, a, another language, uh, any other, any language that is other than English that it, and that is not ASL, then they can actually do it um, the, a day before or the day of because that language line is, is available. But typically for any other accommodations, we ask for two weeks in advance. And the great thing about our constituent services person is that she can assess if we are the best person to help with a particular case, right? So although she's not a lawyer herself, but her knowledge has allowed, and, and our connection as an office has allowed us to um, redirect folks and really make sure that they're connected to those channels so that we're not just sending them blindly. It's like, okay, who at the same time can provide legal access and has these accommodations and how can Moya support? And if we can't support, then we just try to, 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 to refer them to the best of our abilities. Sounds great. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Wesley, go ahead. Hi, Wes here. Thank you for your presentation, Luigi. I have two questions. First of all, I don't, well, you had a wonderful presentation, but you did not uh, mention a lot about disabilities within your presentation. So I'm curious as to the process for that and identifying people who may have disabilities who are also immigrants. Um, and what would you do if someone identified themselves as that? What would that process look like? Sure, so thank you for this question. Um, Yes, so in the past, whenever we've encountered um, someone of an immigrant background who also has a disability, usually they call with someone else. And so we're able to very quickly identify that disability and, and quickly connect with the language and communications access department to make sure that they're being met, right? That, that they're getting the support that they need. Um, and that being said, one thing that I've learned through uh, Jennifer, who works at, uh, at LCA, is that uh, approaching, uh, hosting a session with a lawyer um, in a different language and also with ASL, I, I believe two different interpreters are needed, where one interpreter is translating from the target language to English, and then from, um, and then there's also the, the part where, it, uh, ASL is being translated and, and it's a very interesting dynamic that I have not witnessed on my own, but that my colleagues have. And also I believe most recently we, we've done this as well. And, and, and so there is a process that does exist. And as far as publishing it widely, I think what we've done is we've connected with our community partners and we've also let them know about services being available in, in LCA. And I think on our flyer, even that information is available, that accommodations are available, and, and, and we get this translated into all of the language, all of the spoken languages that we've interacted with. So, so that's the one thing that I'll share. And one more thing that I'll share is, as the community engagement person for the office, I've also interacted with um, community leaders that also, um, that, that shared that they had a disability whether it was visual or whether it was um, um, through speech. And the great thing is we were able to communicate enough to set up calls and to make sure that they were, that they are um, comfortable enough to, to, to not only meet with us, but to also share what their needs are. Okay, great. Thank you. And my next question. I also serve on the board for a local nonprofit agency called Deaf Inc. And from my understanding, some of the immigrants do come to Deaf Inc's offices for services. So one interesting thing that I found out is that we do offer some resources for these immigrants, but not all of the resources because um, some of them are funded by the federal government and some by the state. 
and they require specific funding uh, to be provided only for U.S. citizens. These services only provided to U.S. citizens. So that is a challenge when a uh, individual comes in who's an immigrant to Deaf Inc. and we're not able to provide specific services because of funding issues. So it sounds like how you've gathered uh, funding for your organization and your office has been wonderful. Um, and hold on one second. Sometimes there are different programs that um, people are eligible for, and they're only eligible if they have a certain um, immigration status. S services specifically for deaf or hard of hearing people. And when we, when we get those funds. So I'm, I don't know what, what other funds are, are available that you would provide as well. That is a great question. I, I'd have to bring this to my team and really discuss on this about them. Oh, and do one thing I did want to mention is I believe we've interacted with Deaf Inc. as well with Terry and I believe, and and who is wonderful and and oh my such a such an amazing um, person that I've connected with and I believe it was my first experience just having this um, a virtual session with someone who 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 interacted in ASL and and, and had an interpreter available. And, and that was something that we started talking about, right? Uh, how to find funding, additional funding to support folks who are not necessarily eligible for some certain services that are funded by the state or by the federal government. So I think this is something that I can run by the team. And one thing that I'll say is we have not come across a lot of immigrants who have disabilities who are getting in touch with us. And, and not that there aren't, I'm pretty sure there are a lot of different barriers that are even preventing people from interacting with us. I mean, even folks without disabilities or, or who say that they, they don't, who, who don't identify as both people with disabilities or people of different abilities, I should say, have such a hard time reaching out to us, right? Because of other factors. So maybe one thing that I could discuss with the team is maybe finding better ways to more inclusive ways to um, share what our office does and really, really what service, and, and that in itself can help inform what services could become available, not only in collaboration with the Disabilities Commission, but also with language and communication access and any other department that could further support this, right? So this is something that I'll have to discuss with the team. But what a wonderful point and what a wonderful set of questions. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Elizabeth has her hand up and I, that's gotta be the last question um, because we need to move on. Sure. So. Uh, okay, thanks. I'm Elizabeth Jean Clower. Thank you very much for that presentation. That was very informative. Um, yes, and follow up to, um, what you just raised um, uh, about the, I think there, in addition to the other, some of the other barriers, I think in some um, cultural and ethnic uh, groups from other countries, there are the, the element of stigma or otherness, um, even in, to the extent you can even make a generalization about kind of a, um, people who are from this country and have had lived disability experience at whatever level, whether they were born with um, a certain way or um, in their life experience um, acquired or what, whatever found themselves with a disability. But I, my, in, in certain um, conversations I've had with people, there's an even higher level of stigma, whether it's blaming the mother for a child who might have a disability or you know, kind of a shame of being out in public. And some of that is certainly a very complex topic to uh, um, unravel. But I think that element of outreach or partnering with different groups and 
I didn't know, for instance, if you already, your office is already involved with school systems and helping um, uh, people who might have a child um, on the autism spectrum, for instance, um, and also be from another country or have maybe would have had um, would have had some language challenges anyway. But where there are specific um, aspects of getting them into the right kind of um, individualized educational programming, I didn't know if that's a partnership you're already involved in. Thank you so much for for bringing that point. I. Specifically with the Boston Public Schools, not that I'm aware of. However, we've connected with a few different community organizations that do provide that kind of support. I think you make such a great point that stigma in other cultures around people, with, um, um, individuals with disabilities or um, individuals with other abilities, um, is it, it, is is higher, and it is it is very different uh, in in the cultural context uh, of, of these countries. Um, so I think we're connect we've connected with Space MA with Asha Abdullahi, I believe, um, who does a lot of great work with mothers um, and their children, um, who I believe are on the autistic spectrum. Now I have not worked a lot with her, but I know we've connected with 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 Asha, and I've, actually I've connected with her just last Friday, just just looking for. Um, she was looking for a few more resources. So this is something that I'm actually happy to connect with Andrea on, um, just to see what other resources exist. Because I know that one thing that, because this is a smaller pool when it comes to the intersecting lives of immigrants, uh, one thing that some of these organizations are looking for, for, for example, is space, right? So space to, 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 to not only establish themselves, but also to, to, to serve as a center to, to, to help parents that have children who, who need to integrate better in the Boston public school system. So this is a path that I know that Moya as an office is very happy to explore and with a partnership with um, the Disabilities Commission um, as a guide. I know that this is something that we could, we could continue to move forward with. And, and hopefully in the future, near future, we could continue to get your input. That'd be great. Thank okay, you. thank you. All right, thanks for your presentation. It was very enlightening. My pleasure. Uh, Thank you so much for having me. Oh, no problem. Uh, let's move on to the presentation Be Together Initiative. Good afternoon. Go Thanks so much for having me. My name is PJ McCann. I'm a deputy director of the Boston Public Health Commission and a resident of Dorchester. And thank you so much for having me tonight. Um, so I was asked to just come and share a few words about Mayor Wu's new uh, vaccine requirement for certain indoor spaces. And this, this was issued as an order of the Boston Public Health Commission under the existing declaration of a public health emergency relative to COVID-19. and. As everyone on the call, uh, I'm sure knows, at, at the time the, the order was announced on uh, December 20th, Boston was really entering into the Omicron surge, which, um, as everybody has seen, really did result in, in a vast spread of COVID-19. And this is really intended to, to get ahead of that, um, but also to make sure that as we recover from the Omicron spike, that. Uh, that when people are out and about in places where uh, where it's difficult to stay masked and um, and people are in close quarters, that um, that they can be as safe as possible. So the order uh, went into effect um, on Saturday, um, January fifteenth, and again it requires people to show proof of vaccination against COVID nineteen. And in this first phase, that's just one dose and individuals over the age of twelve at indoor dining, which includes bars and nightclubs indoor fitness, which includes things like gyms, and indoor entertainment, which includes broadly event spaces. So if it's if it's a space that's um, being rented out or used for an event, um, we include um, all of those types of spaces in um, in the scope of the order. And again, the, the sort of, a lot of people have asked questions about why the, the line was drawn around these spaces. And again, it, 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 we really sort of followed um, 
some of the guidance that we issued in, in sort of the first wave of the pandemic where we looked at where are people really most close to each other and uh, again, unable to mask. We, Boston does have um, a face coverings order that, that is still in effect on like a lot of places. And, and we, we do think that that has had a protective effect, but even within that order, as everybody knows, there is the ability to remove the mask temporarily to eat or drink. Um, and so the order really, really is to sort of cover these higher risk places. Um, and thank you for pulling up the slide, Andrea. So this, this does give a little bit more detail about sort of the, the phasing in of the order. And again, the, the, while we do think that this will definitely have a public health effect of reducing the spread of COVID-19 in these places, we also know that the most important intervention against COVID-19 is um, encouraging as many residents as possible to be vaccinated. So, you know, we did want to build in the flexibility to allow people to get vaccinated. So this timeline sort of reflects that, um, that thinking. And so it, it does require people over the age of 12 to have one dose of vaccine. And looking at our most recent data, the, the, that sort of percentage of Boston residents in that, that age group 12 plus with one dose is over 90%. So we do think that, you know, although there is a great deal of, of pushback in, in certain corners of the public, uh, we do think that, that broadly a lot of members of the public and a lot of restaurants and other covered entities themselves were sort of ready for this step. A lot of them had, had made this policy decision on their own and sort of the city taking a leadership role and setting a uniform standard. Uh, we heard from our COVID-19 advisory committee um, which is chaired by my executive director, Basola Ojikutu. Uh, we sort of heard that loud and clear that the consensus among, uh, among resident owner, owners themselves, themselves was, uh, was that this was the right thing to do. So you can see the, the full phased implementation. The next phase is February 15th, which goes to two doses for the same group. And then in, in March, we start to bring it down to the younger age group, five to 11. And then by May, it will cover all individuals over age of five. Uh, proof of full vaccination, which for the purposes of this order, we, um, we mean to say two doses, although you know, we have received a lot of questions about um, ex ex extending the order to cover booster doses, which, uh, which we anticipate may be, um, may be a topic for policy decisions in the future and we'll sort of engage with the community on that and we'll continue to engage with the public health data as it as it comes in and again i should say you know this is an emergency public health order and uh, while we think that vaccinations will continue to be uh, critically important moving forward uh, the order as a sort of a legal mandate will only exist as long as we think that these types of emergency orders are um, are necessary to protect the public and Andrea, I forget if I have another slide after this. Great, so this, this again, just sort of goes into a little bit greater detail about the, the types of spaces. And I, I know time is, um, is critical here, so I, I won't read through all of them, but again, I would sort of focus on, um, it really focuses on places where food is served, where drinks are served, um, events, and indoor fitness settings. Um, next, any more? Great, and so just in terms of the logistics of how this interaction goes at the at the entrance to a place, we we again wanted to make this as low barrier as possible for both the covered entities, you know, the restaurants and, and bars and and others, as well as um, residents and, and other visitors who are coming. So we didn't prescribe that it needs to be any one kind uh, of, of vaccination proof. So it could be your vaccination card, it could be a digital image of your card, a picture on your phone, and there is a, a Be Together Boston app. So that, that really what, what that app is, is just sort of a, a handy place for you to store the, the image that you've taken of your vaccination proof on your phone. It is, I think it's important to also note that the state has an app that if you've been vaccinated in Massachusetts, you can get the actual QR code that connects to your actual digital vaccination record in the state's database. Um, but again, we that that is certainly a, a fine way to, to show your vaccination status, but we want it to be as flexible as possible in, uh, in what you can use, because we know that certain populations uh, sort of have preferences for, you know, being able to show the, the vaccination card and, and others are more comfortable with 
an app-based approach. Um, so next, if there are them. I, this is Andrea, just quick question. I wanna make sure I'm right on this. Um, it, you can show proof of vaccination for the FDA approved or any WHO approved vaccine, is that correct, or only FDA? That, that is correct. It's, it's any WHO approved, um, approved vaccination. Great, thanks. And then I think this is the last slide. Great, and, and so this is the, the frequency asked ask questions. I, I should say there is you know, much more detailed information than what I've presented here, and Luigi's a tough act to follow, so my, I'm sure my, my presentation wasn't as uh, comprehensive as, as his, but I will say you know, one of our most frequently asked questions is about um, how reasonable accommodations are handled in these interactions at, um, at the front door of, of covered establishments. And also, you know, the, the order covers um, covers employees of all people that are working in in places that are covered establishments. And we have um, we have issued guidance. While it's not the city's position to be giving legal advice to individual businesses, we did want to sort of give some guidance and some frameworks to underscore how interactions with um, with members of the public who are claiming either a medical disability or other civil rights related uh, reason why they cannot be vaccinated. So we've, we've encouraged that um, that those interactions be as respectful as possible and that um, they sort of open up uh, with the same kind of dialogue that any other um, ADA type of accommodation uh, request would would follow. So that's, that's guidance that we've put out. We continue to, to sort of answer um, a lot of questions on that, a lot of questions on the employment side as, as members of this, uh, this body, I'm sure know the city of Boston has its own um, employment uh, vaccination requirement and, and we understand how, um, how heavy a lift it is to, to sort of do all this documentation and we're um, sort of working as closely as we can with, with businesses on, on questions they have as they, um, as they implement these policies in their own workplaces. So while we're, while we're talking about questions, I'm, I'm happy to take any of them that, that you all have. Go ahead, folks. This is Andrea with the commission while folks are thinking or typing their questions. I just want to say that, um, you know, the commission itself um, and Commissioner Makash um, is the Title II coordinator under federal law um, focused on uh, city and, and local government programs being accessible. Um, so we're not an enforcement agency uh, for, for any of the customer service questions. That said, uh, we have been actively involved in the discussions with um, BPHC and, and PJ and others uh, to provide that guidance on um, disability related issues uh, that might come up related to this policy. Commissioner Makash, anything you wanna add there? Yes, I just add one thing and that is that we are giving the messaging to businesses that they can't just say no immediately to an accommodation. They are required to engage in a dialogue with the person requesting the accommodation. Uh, what the accommodation will end up being is gonna be a very individual situation depending on the person and the business. So we can't really give any guidance on that, but just be assured that uh, people with disabilities won't be um, like ignored or they won't be immediately denied. The restaurants and businesses have gotten clear messaging that they have to engage in a dialogue and we're here to support that. And Commissioner, this is Jerry. Um, sorry I was a bit, bit late tonight, but, um, but just so on, that I'm clear, um, uh, the guidance that businesses are, are getting are for their individual employees or for patrons, uh, patrons coming in into their, their establishments, or both. That's a, that's a great question, and, and the, the answer is both. Um, and, and as you know, sort of the, the way that dialogue happens is a little bit different in the sort of public accommodations and employment context. So um, in the guidance, and, and I did put in the chat, the first link that I put in the chat is sort of the specific reasonable accommodation guidance, and the second link is sort of the overall web page that includes frequently asked questions. And so, you know, we do advise um, business owners that are, you know, interacting with members of the public, you know, as they enter their establishments to not ask for documentation, but as Commissioner Makash has said and, and has given great advice on, um, 
is to not ask for documentation, but to in, engage in that, that good faith dialogue and determine whether a reasonable accommodation can be made. Um, and so it, you know, it, it encourages accommodations that include, um, you know, people not being in the establishment if they don't have to be, sort of encouraging takeout rather than dine in. Um, and on the employment side, you know, it, it, it also, you know, again, encourages a, a respectful dialogue, but, but does recognize that in the employment context, you know, additional documentation can be asked for and, and reviewed. Um, so, you know, we've, we've tried to be as flexible as we can while, while giving businesses um, the information that they need to have these conversations, understanding that many of them are, are small businesses that don't necessarily have legal counsel on staff or sort of the ability to, um, or, or, you know, a lot of expertise in handling disability and other civil rights related interactions. And, uh, we've done trainings, uh, webinars weekly with the businesses so they can ask questions. And one question that came up was related to, you know, reasonable accommodations when that came up. We tell the businesses that we know you've always done this because people with disabilities have always been able to request accommodations. It's not a new concept, but this is a very specific request for information. So we really want to make the lines very clear that people who are just coming in for a service, you cannot ask them for like medical documentation or you know any personal records. It's a different story, like PJ said, with employment. And I know this board is very well informed and very well educated, but as Andrea said, um, I work on Title II. The employment is covered under ADA Title I, and public accommodations are covered under ADA Title III. So all of the ADA kind of melds together, but there are very specific titles which cover each piece of the law. And we know the businesses are very used to this. We just want to make sure that they're engaging in a dialogue in the proper way and what they ask for for documentation. So, Gary again. Um, so just so I'm clear, uh, businesses have, uh, are being instructed not to ask for uh, proof of vaccination? So business, uh, businesses are being asked to, to ask customers for proof of vaccination, but if, um, if a customer um, presents a claim that they were unable to get vaccinated due to a medical condition or disability, um, they're not being at, they're, they're being guided to not ask customers for paperwork about their disability consistent with um, you know, federal guidance on administration of ADA claims. Thank you so much. I, I, you know, I just wanted to be, make sure that I, I'm clear. Uh, sure. No, thank you. Talking with friends or, co or, or colleagues and, and stuff. And another uh, point that I just wanted to make, um, my medical practice you know, is, is a pretty large medical practice here, here in Boston, and they have their own app uh, for folks that are, are part of that practice. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that other other folks may have different apps that they can use other than the ones that have been, you know, established by the city or, or whatnot too. So hopefully people would take advantage of that because I, I find it uh, very easy to to just pull up my app and, and show my proof of vaccination right on my phone. Yeah, that, that's great. And I do see one other in the chat uh, from Mr. Ireland. I, I can read it out. For those walking in food halls like Time Out, Boston Public Market, and Hub Hall, where it's a mix of takeout and dine-in, do they have to check on the on vaccination cards? So the, the guidance that we give when it's sort of a, any old business that has both takeout and sit down is that when that first interaction happens at the counter, that's usually a reasonable place to just ask the customer, is it for here or to go, which is you know a question that's that's often asked in that in that interaction. Then if they say for here, then to ask that that second question about can I see your your vaccination documentation. In the context of, of food courts, um, we we think in, in many of them. So the, the legal responsibility is on sort of the owner of the food court. And I think in a lot of those places there, um, there is sort of a, a security presence to help uh, staff that space um, or some other staffing. And so, you know, the two things that the order requires is that you post signage and that you check. So we would advise sort of that, that signage is, is, post, is, is posted sort of at the places where people will be sitting down in those spaces. and. You know, we do want to give um, some flexibility to to those types of businesses to sort of just decide who specifically will check. Some food courts may decide that 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 conversation about are you staying to dine or are you taking out might happen at the individual 
vendors site. Some others may decide that they will um, sort of let people get their food and then be asked to show by somebody else or at the entrance to the to the facility. So it, it really does depend on sort of the physical layout of the space. But what I would say in general is that it's, it's the responsibility of the owner, um, but we sort of do defer to them specifically about what works best uh, for how that's implemented. Lucia, go ahead. Thank you very much, Olivia. I hope you can hear me all right. Yes. Um, excellent. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, McCann. As I said, my name is Ducia, and I want to apologize in advance for repeating a you're repeating an answer to somebody. I had technical issues, so I maybe then three questions. Uh, they they're probably like a continuation of the first one. Uh, so the first question I have is, uh, so I'm also in the medical field, and I know that there are people who have, okay, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh, yes, right, sorry. Um, there are people who have immune-compromised health issues. So I know that, I mean, I know that they're the principles that they should get the medical exception or something, but what, is there like some kind of accommodation or something for them? Um, how to help them? That's my first question. Mm -hmm. uh, the second question is: Will there be? Uh, I know that you are providing now, or the city is now providing a rapid, rapid, rapid testing. Mm -hmm. So if they could be provided at restaurants or local businesses in case somebody's worried that the person who comes in has COVID, quote unquote, before they can even enter to get seated. And the third one, um, I, I assure you, I'm not trying to be a wise guy here, but as I said, I'm in the medical field, but I noticed that there are some people who, although they're, they change the regulations about when people can travel into Boston from, let's say, another state, but I, but I know for a fact that some other state, they have a different a vaccine card that looks different than the one from Boston or Massachusetts. So what do you do for those cases? Uh, yeah, that's, those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for those. Um, so I'll, I'll test my memory by starting with, with the first. So I, I think in, in the case of an immunocompromised individual who sort of required an accommodation sort of to be protected from, from sort of exposure to COVID-19, you know, we would advise that, that those conversations about you know, how they could be accommodated is, is it sort of uh, more social distancing sort of we would think along the lines of, of what what are the what are the ways to prevent the spread of COVID nineteen, um, and sort of generally advise businesses to engage in a respectful dialogue about what the individual customer with a disability needs. Uh, we we also know from from sort of outreach that we've done that um, many people who are immunocompromised have been supportive of the initiative because of the sort of the added public health protection that that it provides in these close spaces. So again, I think. Those are our individualized um, conversations, and we're sort of in encouraging businesses to have them in a way that's you know compliant with with ADA and, and sort of human decency as well. Um, to the the test kit suggestion, I, I think that's a great one. As as you know, the, the demand for these kits is is enormous. We uh, we had five hundred thousand to give out the week before Christmas, and and they went like hotcakes, but. We have been um, putting in orders. I know that the state and federal levels of government are sort of feeling the need and intervening. The, um, the, the federal website where you can request for is live now. So I would advise any members of, of the, this group to, to get them and advise, you know, as leaders in your community, share that information with others. The city, you know, recognizing that, um, that when we just made them available to all members of the public, uh, and that's not the entirety of what we did. We also, you know, reserved many, many of them for um, targeted outreach by community partner organizations that, that you know, did help to get them into the hands of, of populations in highest need, including disability populations. So, um, so that's what I'd say to the first and third questions. Can you remind me the second question? Um, of course. Um, as I said, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I it's just some, an observation I made. 
Um, there has been, I've noticed there has been uh, the vaccine cards that people get from out of state. They look different. I, I, I can't show you right now picture, but I see, uh, when I was looking at the company, like, is that the vaccine card? Like, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just never seen those. So what do you do? Like, is it like, does it just matter that you say vaccine card or you want to know what, what happened? Yeah. To the so you know, we, we broadly you know we made we made a couple of policy decisions early on. The first, and I thought an important one, was to not require people to show a separate ID in New York. You have to show your government issue ID as well as your vaccine card. So one, we didn't require that, um, just you know, for a lot of you know immigrant advancement reasons, as well as the burden on a business owner to be you know comparing to and, and crossing. So there is, I'd say. In consistent with that, there was sort of a lot of good faith built into the way we've implemented this. And we, you know, advise the businesses and we require them to take whatever proof a person gives. Um, so there is some honor system built into it, but we do think that that strikes the right balance because there is such a broad uh, range across the 50 states and across, you know, international boundaries about how vaccine proof is issued and we didn't want to require anything that required people to go to their primary care doctor to get their physical vaccination record if they didn't get a CDC card. I, for a while, until I got my booster, I didn't have my, my CDC card, but I had pictures of, you know, the form at, that Tufts had for, you know, public health officials and first responders, but um, sort of recognizing the full range of proof that people had, we, we wanted to encourage restaurants to you know, do their best to take a look at it, but also, you know, have some element of trust that uh, that people are presenting what they're presenting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you for having me. Yeah. So that was great. Uh, great information. And check the chat for the links to uh the reasonable accommodation information um the be together website um and let's move on to the chair's report which is me um the Mass.gov has a site called Trust the Facts, Get the Vax. And one of the pieces of information I came across that I found very interesting and I think needs to be broadcast is that you can get vaccinated even if you are undocumented because getting a vaccine will not impact you or your family's immigration status. And the public charge rule does not apply to getting the vaccine. So that's one more reason folks should feel very comfortable about going out and getting vaccinated. Um, the second piece of information is that if you are on the personal care attendant program, for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, it's paid for by MassHealth. Uh, you now send your timesheets and all your paperwork and information to one fiscal intermediary. And that is Tempest Unlimited. Uh, MassHealth is having a session for PCA consumer employers on that, um, go to tempestunlimited.org for more information. Um, they've also changed the timesheet itself. So if you're like me and you've got 50 copies of the old timesheets, you can now use them as drawing paper. Um, and that's what I have. So let's move on to the advisory board member spotlight. Carl, take it away. 
So, Olivia, when you asked me to do this community member spotlight, I was like, I don't know, I'm quiet and reserved, I don't like to talk about my stuff. Just kidding, I'm more than happy to do it, and if anything, you're gonna have a hard time keeping me to a few minutes. So, my name is Carl Richardson. I have been a resident of Boston for almost 25 years. I am a deaf-blind individual in that I have a dual sensory loss of hearing and vision. I wear two hearing aids. And, and I have a guide dog in terms of assistive technology. I use uh, a screen reader to access my computer and an iPhone with voiceover to access the smartphone. And sometimes I use magnifications uh, in certain circumstances. I have a guide dog. I am president of the Massachusetts Guide Dog Users of Massachusetts, so I'm fairly active in the service animal area. I am also an ADA coordinator for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, for the Massachusetts State House. I also serve as an advocate on a number of boards and advocacy organizations for people with disabilities, such as the Cal Center for the Blind, Open Door Arts, formerly um, Very Special Arts of Massachusetts, uh, DBCAM, which is the Deaf Blind Community Access Network, uh, and I've been married to my lovely wife, Megan Sullivan, for 17 years, who is a professor and assistant provost at Boston University. We like to go to the beach. We like to take long walks. I'm a huge film buff, and as a result, when I lost my vision, I was disappointed when I could no longer for see films and movies like I used to for a while, so I got into the world of audio description, and I advocate a lot for audio description, so I am chair of the Audio Description Project for the American Council of the Blind, where we advocate for audio description in museums, live theater, movie theater, television shows, streaming services. Um, and so with audio description, I am able to watch film and movies like I used to. And I have been on this committee uh, for at least 10 years, I forget, the Boston Disability Commission, if not longer, but I've um, been on the committee for a while, and I um, enjoy watching all the hard work that all the members do and the progress that we've made, along with the staff and the commissioner at the Boston Disability Office. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. I, I appreciate audio description very, very much. I always get the headset when I go to the movie theater because I've realized how much I miss when I watch a movie and can't make out a lot of it. <laughs> um, so the next person to do member spotlight, uh, all you have to do if you want to do it is email Andrea or myself and let us know that you want to do February's spotlight or March's spotlight. Um, yeah. Thank you, Carl. All right. Uh, it is time for the commissioner's report. Take it away, commissioner. Thanks, Olivia. And Carl, you will be a tough act to follow. But I will say that I always make use of the captions when I'm watching TV because, like you said, Olivia, you miss so much that you don't even realize. So I'm a big fan of assistive technology myself. Okay, so I have some slides that Andrea is going to pull up. Sorry, this is Andrea, sorry, give me one second. I almost pulled up the Be Together slides again, which are not the, the helpful ones That's in this okay. case. Okay, all right, great. So while Andrea's uh, pulling the slides up, here we go. I'm gonna start with some administrative updates. First, I would like to let the board know that um, I'm honored to have been reappointed by Mayor Wu as the city's ADA Title II Coordinator and Disability Commissioner. So um, that was effective in December, so I really appreciate it. And if anyone could describe a dream job, that's what I have. So I feel very lucky and very honored, and I love serving 
my city. I was born and raised in South Boston. I still live there, and I just love my job more than I could ever say. So I'm very happy about that. Congratulations. And, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and as Carl said, he is an original board member, and he's, so he's been on the commission. The board was formally established in 2009, so he's been on for 13 years. And I've been in my role as commissioner for 11 years. And then um, I want to also take a minute to introduce our new staff member. Many of you may know Colleen from her years of dedicated advocacy work in the city, but Colleen Flanagan is our new outreach and, educate and engagement coordinator. So welcome, Colleen. She's attending her first Congratulations. Oh, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Very exciting and great to be in service with you all. Great. So you'll be hearing a lot more from Colleen um, in the coming months. She's working on some s initiatives that she'll update you on soon. Uh, also, five new city council members were sworn in in early January, and they held their first meeting of 2022. You may have heard that Mayor, News, Mayor Wu's inauguration celebration was postponed for now because of the surge of Omicron, so we'll update you moving forward if that is rescheduled. And then some updates on Mass and Cass. You may be following along in the news, but the city has made a real commitment to get people services and get them into more safe conditions because of the frigid weather and the unsafe conditions on Mass and Cass. So Mayor Wu has really been approaching this issue through a public health lens, prioritizing safety and health of residents. As of January 13th, city workers have removed all the tents and cleaned up the area. Outreach workers have been engaging with unhoused residents to determine their immediate needs. And all residents were offered treatment for substance use, physical wellness, and mental health. So far, 154 residents have been relocated to either shelter or low threshold housing. And the mayor's made a real commitment to low threshold housing because some people refuse shelter or housing because they have conditions that won't support it. But low threshold housing allows people to live with a partner, um, it allows people to be housed if they're not fully involved in a um, treatment program. So it really gets people into a safe environment and we're thrilled with her efforts. The housing options that are available currently are the Southampton Street Shelter, the Shattuck Hospital Cottage Community. If anyone has seen that online, it's a, a new series of mini cottages that were built in just a few weeks and they're all accessible and available for people who are currently homeless. She's also um, putting people in the Roundhouse Hotel near the area of Mass and Cass and the Envision Hotel in Mattapan. Um, I'll go through my slides and then if people have questions, I'll take them at the end. So then just to reiterate all the information that we got from PJ, a uh, brief update on vaccines, boosters, and testing. Uh, the COVID 19 Omicron variant is still surging, as you know, and hospitals are currently over capacity. So it's really important to stress vaccination. It remains as our best tool to prevent death, severe illness, and spread. Um, the indoor mask mandate has not been affected by the vaccine mandate, so we still have, uh, and we still have clear face masks. If anyone needs them, please get the word out to your communities. We will mail them out at no charge. We receive some of the test kits that PJ mentioned from the Boston Public Health Commission. We distributed them to BCIL for consumer employers, to SEIU directly for the PCAs, and to other disability organizations. And um, we trusted that they would uh, get them out to their communities. The city is still hosting walk-in clinics for vaccines and boosters, and there's more information at boston.gov. If you log on to the city website, boston.gov, all the information on COVID is right on the homepage. The city's also set up walk-in testing sites. A big one was opened yesterday at the bowling building in Nubian Square, and that is open um, during daytime hours, and it's just a walk-in. You don't need to make an appointment. Free test kits are available, as we heard from the federal government, at www.covidtest.gov. A household can get up to four free tests. And as PJ went into in detail, as of January 15th, Proof of at least one dose of vaccine for people age 12 and up is required in all of Boston's dine-in restaurants, gyms, and entertainment venues. Proof of a second dose kicks in on February 15th, and children 5 to 11 will phase in beginning March 1st. 
and also wanted to let people know that we have a very, very limited number of rapid test kits in our office for people with disabilities who are in severe need and can't get out to get to a test site. So please email us if you know anyone who's in that position. And we'll go to the next slide. So some updates on previous work we did on the captions ordinance. Thanks again to Wesley Ireland for bringing this to our attention. Um, now that the new council members have been sworn in and we have our new outreach and engagement staff, we will begin working on the actual program. So our next steps are to work with Council Flynn's office to convene a working group that will outline the details of the program, including developing an outreach plan for business and disability community members, and Colleen will be working closely on that. We're going to lay out the program parameters, including the formal complaint and resolution process, create tools with instructions on how to enable captions and a list of resources for businesses, create an implementation plan and establish a timeline for launching. And this is something we really need to be careful with because we know uh, businesses are really struggling right now and we don't want to, we want to make sure this message gets through and it's a priority so we'll probably wait a little bit for implementation. We need time to develop the plan anyway, but we don't want to launch it during the COVID mandate, uh, the vaccine mandate, so um, hopefully in the spring we'll be launching the program. And we, um, on a related note, we're interviewing a candidate this week for our full-time in-house ASL interpreter position. So we're really excited about that and we hope that this will work out and we'll get that person on board. Uh, just a few brief architectural access updates. Um, really good news, our department has been awarded an ADA municipal grant by the Mass Office on Disability to make ADA improvements in City Hall. So we're working on an upgrade of the third floor mezzanine in Boston City Hall. If any of you are familiar with the area, I call it the giant brick pyramid because it's like a pyramid of brick steps that leads to a little area where the city has some public events. And the only way to get there now is through an inclined lift that goes gradually up the stairs. But we're working with the public facilities department to put in um, a vertical lift, which will look like an elevator and function like an elevator. And this will be helpful not for, for just people in wheelchairs, but for people with balance issues, uh, people in stro with strollers and young kids. I mean, it's a lot of stairs for anybody to walk up, so we're really excited about the grant. And thanks a lot to MOD. Um, you may know that there's a hearing next week on three bills that the Architectural Access Board is supporting. It's next Thursday, January 26th. And I have signed up to testify. And Patricia from our office is also testifying. So I wanted to throw it out to the board if anybody wants to testify with us. You can form a panel. So if you'd like to testify, um, the two main pieces of the bill are that they expand accessible housing and that they will expand the um, AAB's um, power to enforce workplace access. Right now, they currently cannot do that for any places that are strictly for employees. So welcome anybody to testify um, next week with us. Um, also on the curb ramp uh, settlement, we have been working closely with the Public Works Department. Their new ADA coordinator is in place. You met him a few months ago. He came to a meeting. But he just submitted his first annual report um, on the city's progress. So we've made some great progress so far in just a few months. And one of the next big steps that we'll unveil is we're working on a dedicated form for our web page so members of the public can request a new curb ramp if one's missing um, or request repairs to a broken curb ramp. So stay for that. Stay tuned for that launch soon. And then my last slide, um, just some general updates. Olivia covered the PCA program changes. I sit on the PCA Workforce Council um, by the, on the state, appointed by the governor. And so we're doing a lot of work on the transition to one fiscal intermediary. Cur um, there used to be four, and now they're all transitioning to one. So we're trying to get the word out to PCA empl consumer employers to make sure they get their paperwork into Tempest Unlimited. There are still many consumer employers who haven't completed their paperwork. However, PCAs will still be paid during the transition process, but we really need to get the word out. And as Olivia said, MassHealth is holding two information sessions this week. They're tomorrow and Friday from 11 to 1. And you can email us if you need the exact um, link. You can also find it online. And then just a few notes about the 2022 board membership and elections. So we currently have two open board seats. We had one that's been existing for a while. 
And then I wanted to let board members know that Kyle stepped down um, in December. So now we have two open board seats. We currently have six board members who are on expired appointments right now. So we want to have those members think about your interest in continuing to serve. You're all doing a great job, so we just want to hear from you um, about potential reappointment. And we'll plan to hold elections this spring for the executive committee positions. That is chair, vice chair, secretary, and treasurer. If you're interested in being on the executive committee, please email me and let me know which seat you're interested in. You can also nominate another board member for position on the executive committee. And then when we decide to hold the, the um, elections, I will formally nominate members for each position and we'll have the vote either in February or March. And so you don't have to feel self-conscious about nominating yourself. It can all be um, kept between me and, and you. So if you'd like to volunteer to be uh, in the election process, please email me. And I encourage anyone who hasn't served to please think about doing so. And that's all um, my report. Um, I can take questions now and then we're gonna hear from um, a new staff member in the mayor's office. If anyone has questions, I'm here to answer them. Okay, we can give it a few minutes and then give you questions while I turn it over to Anshi. Anshi is the new, um, let me find her title. She is the, uh, she's newly appointed to support the city's boards and commissions, so I'll turn it over to her and let her talk about her job. Hi everyone, um, it's so nice to meet you tonight. Uh, my name is Anshi Moreno. Um, I want to start off um, just by saying thank you. Um, I've been listening in. Um, the work and the policy visions that you're pushing through are incredibly important to making Boston a better city. Um, and I met actually um, just a few days ago, or maybe time is, Time is uh, passing through very quickly. So uh, sometime in the past week, I uh, met with Commissioner McCosh and Andrea Patton, um, and they shared with me the work you've been doing, um, uh, like the reviewing the design of City Hall Plaza, and it just stuck with me that the projects you're working on are no small tasks. And um, I truly believe that they're, they create a city of belonging um, that personally matters so much to me. Um, so I wanted to make sure I start off by saying thank you. Thank you for um, your engagement and your leadership. Um, my name is Anshi Moreno. I grew up in Roxbury. Um, after college, I was a project manager in, in various um, offices in New York City, uh, city government, um, and then returned back home um, to work on Mayor Wu's campaign. Um, so I'm currently serving as a special assistant, uh, focusing solely on boards and commissions for the city. Um, and I wanted to share what our goals are for improving um, what I'm calling a, a boards and commissions program. Um, and provide you some background on how they've run before. Um, so I view boards and commissions as an incredible tool for community engagement. Um, so taking a step back, uh, for me, the purpose of a board is to provide um, relevant city departments and partners uh, a strategic direction and purpose. Uh, but to me, an effective board is proactive and drives uh, the departments to use a lens of equity in the work they do. Um, and so that's the bigger vision and, and what I'm grounding myself in. Um, but for some background on just the administrative side of things, um, we've actually never had a staff person focus solely on boards and commissions. It was a task that was on the on a long um, list of tasks for the deputy chief of policy. Um, and so it's, it's exciting because now we get to build out provide more support for staff and board members and think about how do we get more people involved um, on the boards and commissions. Um, so in the past few weeks, um, I started a few weeks ago, we've been filling in positions that need immediate appointments um, because maybe they don't have quorum or they really need to meet and they have important projects. Um, but moving forward to bring the larger vision to life for boards and commissions, um, we'll be making a lot of administrative changes, um, such as providing staff and board members um, more support and training. Um, and I see that um, your support staff have been incredible in providing you great agendas and amazing training. So um, you're all very lucky, but it's not, um, it's not the case for every board and commission. So I wanna make sure that everyone has that type of support. Um, two, um, I want to build more partnerships with the Chief of Community Engagement and the Chief of Equity and our community partners um, to think about um, how we do the nomination process. So making sure 
um, we are reaching out to as many community organizations as possible ahead of time when positions do open up um, to make sure that we're bringing in more people, more voices. Um, we want to make sure that they are involved in spreading the word about the work that you are doing and the positions that are available. Um, so that's another focus of mine. And my third area of focus will be working with the communications team um, to make sure that these positions are widely shared um, and again, to make sure that your work is highlighted. I think there's a lot of room for improvement across the city to make sure that um, we're getting the word, um, that we're getting the word across every neighborhood and every community group. Um, and that will require having a very clear uh, communications plan on whether that's using social media, whether that's attending local community events and making sure that we have a plan of action solely for communicating what the work um, you're currently doing is. Um, and um, where, where I need your support, of course, um, continue to look for policy proposals um, that we should push in Boston. Um, you are our ears on the ground, um, and I've heard of some of the policy visions that you've pushed through. So I hope you continue to do that, um, and I hope to be a support system for you. So if there's a problem I can help solve, um, please feel free to email me. I will send my contact information um, or to give me a call. Um, and I also need your help to get more people involved. Um, so I, uh, Commissioner Makash mentioned that there are two open seats available. Um, and so I, wanted, I want you to think about um, whether you would like to continue serving. Um, if you have individual nominations, um, I'll put a form in the chat or you can just email me about it. Um, and these are very simple um, nomination procedures where we want um, maybe a resume or a short statement of interest, and then we would follow up with a phone call or a Zoom interview. Um, but we want to make sure that we are getting as many nominations as possible. And um, also, uh, we want to be connected to more organizations. I have a few on my radar that you've worked with before, but you know, as you go about your days and you get involved in other community groups, um, keep boards and commissions in mind. And, and it's a great way to get um, people involved locally and just to get a sense of what they can do. Um, so I'll send that over and um, my email information as well. Um, but I, I hope you know how grateful we are that you're continuing to serve um, and continue to think about um, who else can join and be here and who's not here. Um, and, the, and our vision is to um, create you know, a better experience for all of you and for our staff members and make sure that you, you do have the tools to continue to think about what bold ideas um, we can implement in Boston. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I, mean, I see something in the chat. Oh, okay. It's not a shareable link. I will send that over. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions um, you might have. Thank you. And I'll just add on a few things um, just to let Anchi know. We did meet earlier in the week, but I just want to brag a little bit about my board because they're really dedicated residents. And um, I believe we told you about the captions ordinance that Wesley had suggested. and. We did a lot of great work on that and pushed it through the city council. So that's the one I talked about implementing in the spring. So we're really trying to make connections with the city council as well. And I just think Anchi is gonna be a real source of support, especially um, with her vision and working to implement Mayor Wu's vision with the community boards. So I hope we can take advantage of um, her support. And also to let you know, Anchi, one big thing that the board members do is they write letters of support or concern about issues on the state level, like the vaccine rollout, they had concerns about that. They've written letters to welcome the new mayor and outline their priorities for the administration. So they really do pack a punch when they express an opinion. So I'm always encouraging them to utilize the power that they've been granted by the mayor. So um, you know, I think that we can make 2022 a really um, great year for them utilizing the power that they've been given and making a real impact on Boston like they have already. I completely agree. I think accountability is something that I want to make sure is consistent across Mayor Wu's administration and something that I truly value. So yes, continue, continue to push for that. Um, I, I definitely want to be a partner in that. Yep. Great. And we can take questions for Anchi or myself if anyone has any. This is Andrea with the commission. Um, Olivia, it looks like Jerry uh, mentioned in the chat that he has questions. Go ahead, Jerry. Yeah, thank you. Hi, uh, Anshi. It's nice to meet you, Anna. And 
you know, uh, look forward to working uh, with you. Uh, it sounds like we'll be working uh, closely with with your office and the mayor's office, and I appreciate that um, going forward. Uh, but I do echo the commissioner's uh, commissioner's comments. I think, you know, I've been on the board, uh, you know, five years or so, and I, I think it's one of the one of the you know most active boards that I've that I've had the pleasure to serve on. So I appreciate. I appreciate the work that we all do. Um, one thing that I would I would like uh, uh, us to us to have more focus on is to yeah, I really don't know um, because our meetings are virtual now. I really don't know the impact that we're that our, these monthly meetings are having. So it would be great if we could figure out you know some data in terms of how many people are are, are actually viewing. Uh, viewing uh, the, the meetings. I don't know if there's any way to collect any data uh, like that at all. I don't know if the if Andrea or the commissioner's office has, has thought about that or or you know they can work with you on she on on maybe coming up with ways to capture that data because when we were in person um, there were only a, a few people that that uh, that participated regularly from the public, so I would love to see more, uh, more participation um, uh, by the public at at the monthly meetings. Uh, definitely. So. Yes, I can definitely look into that. Um, I can. Um, I I'll meet with um, Chief Pierre, um, and I'm sure um, I can at least look for the past year and see what that was looking like, or maybe pre and post COVID to see if there's a shift in that pattern, but. No, I believe that should be something that I can um, get my hands on. So I'll, I'll reach out and, and see what I can get for you. And I'll just add, Jerry, we do um, push out different ways to attend the meeting. Like people can log on to the Zoom, but some people don't want to be on camera or participate. They just want to watch. So we always push out that you can watch on the cable channel or you can watch online just on the uh, boston.gov web stream, or you can participate by phone. We have a call in number and you can join the Zoom account. So we might not be able to get numbers on everybody who's participating, but we can definitely um, work with Anshi and the mayor's office to see how we can determine um, participation. But I would love to increase participation. Um, and I hope you all spread the word about our meetings when they come up. So we'll definitely come up with some strategies to do that. And this yeah. is Andrew at the commission. And um, they're also recorded and posted to YouTube. Um, so if you ever want to watch a disability commission meeting from 2010, uh, you can do that. Um, or you'll be able to watch this one as early as tomorrow, I think. So we can definitely get viewers numbers from that, I, I would think. I was going to say they would have views on those, right? OK, great. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's just I would love to see, like I said, a way to capture, like, you know, the, the views or, or you know how many people are participating in whatever way they they feel comfortable to, to participate um, in as well. So um, I did have one additional uh, question as well. Um, where Anshi, you're going to be um, uh, working more closely with with us and with all the boards and and, and whatnot. Um, will the uh, Will the interview process be more centralized? Because I know when I came on this board, you know, that was handled by the commissioner's office. Will that still be, you know, if we nominate anybody or whatnot, will it be going through the commissioner's office or will, will it be more centralized now that, they, that your office is involved? Um, well, I think the commissioner's office just has so much institutional knowledge that it'll definitely rely heavily on, on what you know they know and, and the community partners they know but um you know we want to make the entire process a little bit more open so that means making sure ahead of time we send it out to the organization so that they at least get a notice about it and make sure we have as many nominations as possible and then go through a process of reviewing and um, making those phone calls to um we just want to make sure that it's not just something that you throw you know you throw a resume into but then maybe it's never even considered um, but it also depends, I will say, caveat, that some of the, in the legislation for these boards and commissions um, have very specific guidelines for who can be appointed. So sometimes it has to be a youth delegate, and, and so that means, you know, some applicants won't, um, can't be considered. Um, so it just depends on what the enabling legislation uh, says. Um, but no, I think 
you, the message, if you give it to Commissioner Mikaj, will certainly get to me as well. Um, but I think I just want to provide a support system and not, you know, I just want to make your work easier. Um, so it's, it's, you know, either, either person I think will, will make sure to, um, make sure that people get a response um, and have an opportunity to join these boards. Um, so it, it, it depends, but hoping to make it a more transparent process. Great. And I can Thanks just add, um, I will send the bylaws out to everybody again. I know we've sent them before, but I will send them out so you have them. And one thing to keep in mind is that um, in the time I've been commissioner, I'm on my fourth mayor. So that's four different administrations and every administration does things differently. So under Mayor Menino, he gave me like broad authority to just handle it in my own office. But with a new administration comes new opportunities for partnership. So I'm excited that, um, and we reached out to Mayor Wu actually to see if she had thoughts about who she'd like to appoint because we really want to pay attention to the different neighborhoods, representation from every area of Boston, every type of disability, people from dif different backgrounds and communities. So um, I, I look at this as an opportunity to partner and to really, um, we know Mayor Wu's vision for the city of inclusion and diversity and equity, so um, I think it will be a true partnership with the mayor's office and my commission. Any other Great. questions? Great, anything else? I see one of the phone numbers has uh, been raised. I don't know if that's a question. Hi there. Uh, yes, it's me, it's Dave Vieira from Hyde Park. Yeah, Coming go ahead. Through? Okay. Um, Gary, does your uh, question about more participation mean that you missed me at last month's meeting? I always miss you, David, when you're, when you're not on. Oh, thank you. Um, Commissioner, I just wanted to congratulate you on your reappointment. Um, I myself am very pleased that there's continuity in the position. So thank you for re-signing up. Thank you, David. And I will echo Jerry's uh, sentiment. We always miss you and we love your input. So please keep coming to our meetings. Well, I had a little date with COVID. So uh. I wasn't able to do much of anything for a couple of weeks, but I'm, I'm feeling better now. I'm glad to hear that. That's good to hear, David. That's all I've got. Okay. Thank you, David. Um, let's see here. I think if there's nothing else, um, let's move on to board elections. Um, the commissioner uh, pretty much covered uh, board elections. If you're interested in nominating yourself or someone else, uh, email uh, the commissioner. Is it, should they send it to you, Andrea, or should they send it to directly to you, Commissioner? You can send it to me and Andrea. That's fine. And also for, okay. for board members who are currently in positions, if you'd like to be renominated, please let me know that as well. Okay, cool. Um, announcements? Are there any announcements? Anything? Uh, no? Okay. Uh, old business. Um, speaking of old business, has the IGR uh, situation been I saw that they hired someone for IGR on Twitter, um, but I don't know if that will allow us to set up that Department of Labor meeting we've been interested in. 
This is Andrea with the commission. Great question. Um, I know that two of the, um, my understanding is that the three new folks hired, uh, one is a deputy director of the office, um, and then two are state relations folks. Uh, I don't recall that um, a specific federal relations person has been named. I don't know if the deputy director is handling federal relations or if there's going to be a specific federal relations person, uh, but that is a good reminder for me to ask that question um, in case that's been decided or if that's still on hold. Um, so I will follow up. But I do know okay. also um, to add to that, in our meetings with the Public Facilities Department and the um, building, um, what's the other department? Public property Management. And Property Management. Um, they have both expressed um, their desire to enter into this agreement and really committed to um, supporting City Hall Plaza. Is that the one we're talking about? No, sorry, um, this is Andrea. Uh, I think, well, correct me if I'm wrong, Livia, you're following up on the U.S. Department of Labor's offer to meet with the advisory board in addition to having met with our national group. Okay. But yes on that too. We've also been working yes. on that regarding yes. the, the plaza. <laughs> also old business that we're working on. Yes, we are continuing interest in having a written agreement on that plaza. This is Andrea. I've got the star next to it. It's on my, my to-do list uh, to have an update at next meeting. Excellent. In the words of Mr. Burns. Okay. Um, does anybody have any new business? Anything they want to strike up, start? Um, this is Carl. I just want to say that the governor's state of the state is um, the 25th of January. At, uh, and we do have interpreters, so uh, please go ahead, uh, interpreters for the deaf community. So please tune in and watch the, uh, the governor's state of the state. Um, when is the state of the city? That's what I was going to uh, ask Olivia. Yeah. I haven't heard about that. Uh, Andrea, have you heard anything on that? I don't believe a date has been announced yet. Um, I will check um, that I didn't miss an announcement um, from the press team, but I have not seen an announcement of a date. <coughs> I don't think the mayor typically does a state of the city in their first year, right? Because they haven't been in office long enough. I can't remember that, Carl, but oh, I will yeah. check. Um, I'm not that, sure that's correct. Oh. Okay, I just wanted to... You're saying that's correct? They don't typically do one in their first year? Uh, both the president and the mayor usually do not get a state of the fill in the blank during their first year. It's usually if they have a widely broadcast speech, it's not called that, but very often they do have a speech that sort of sets them up for what's gonna happen for the year ahead without it being specifically a state of the state or state of the city. It also may be that um, the outgoing mayor may have done it before the transition to the new mayor, um, maybe in earlier January, but Mayor Wu transitioned in October. So um, this year is definitely not typical, but we will find out all the details and get back to you. to do, uh, Olivia? Well, we got to do public input first. That's true. Is there any members of the public? Come forward and uh, say something. Can I make oh. my motion? Hearing none, 
Let's make a motion to adjourn. I make a, this is Carl Richardson. I make a motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. Are there any? Excellent. Uh, discussion? None. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> okay. Uh, any opposed? Um, all right. I shall see you in February. The next meeting is February 9th. At 530, uh, 2022. Absolutely. Stay safe. Be together. Get your vaccines. So you can have Burger King. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye, Olivia. Good job.